Good morning, everybody. He is risen. And the right response is, he is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. There we go. I'll get you trained that. I'll get you trained. So he is risen. Praise the Lord for that. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the risen Savior so that we can stand before you washed and cleansed and, and as white as snow, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for that, Lord, and we offer ourselves to you. Just touch our hearts and our minds with what your word has to teach us today. And we just lift all of this up to you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. read this morning from Isaiah chapter 53 verses 10 and 11 because it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief yet when his life is made an offering in for sin he will have many descendants he will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear their sins. Death is not easy to talk about. We don't want to think about it, the finality of it. We'd rather distract ourselves from the ending we know we can't escape. But what if we looked at death as more of a beginning than an ending? Right? Like a butterfly can't be a butterfly until the caterpillar dies in the cocoon. I mean, death becomes a conversion, a metamorphosis, a necessary action in becoming a glorious butterfly. Now, could the same be true for us? I mean, that's what Easter is all about. Because of Easter, because of what Jesus has done, death is no longer an ending, no longer a final farewell, a dark and cold conclusion. No, it's a transition, a necessary step into a glorious resurrection. Jesus died so that we could live. This is love. And she doesn't know. Yes, this is a huge surprise her daughter is planning for her. She actually thinks she's going to a memorial for her ex-husband. <laughs> a good surprise. So, Abund Abundant Love, Love Church, for those of you who don't know where that is, is on the corner of uh, what is it? Esther, is it Esther? Esther and 36, out by the airport. So um, if you could make it, that would be a great great thing. Uh, her daughter would love to uh, have us there uh, to celebrate with her mom uh, on her 84? 80, 
fourth birthday, I think, eighty fifth birthday, something like that. I don't know, Nancy. You're the one who's got the list. <laughs> okay, I couldn't remember if you had your birthday it's on it or not. Um, but so if you make it there, that would be fantastic. Um, Heavenly Father, we just lift all of these prayers up to you. But we have lifted an especially great prayer up to you for the invention of asparagus juice. And it's just, it's just a miracle that, that Dave's numbers have gone the way they have as quickly as they have. And we know that only came because of your hand on his body, Lord. And we thank you and praise you for that and, and giving us that grand information, Lord, as well as all of the other uh, individuals who have had procedures and, and things going on with their health, Lord, your hand has been in all of those. Sometimes it's that direct touch. Sometimes it's the touch through our doctors and nurses, Lord, that you have gifted so well to take care of us. Lord, we just lift all of this up to you, Lord, and we especially lift Carl up to you this morning, who's still wrestling with that heart rate problem, Lord, and, and we just pray that you could take and just reach down and, and touch his heart and slow it down to where it's supposed to be, Lord. And just let him have that, that recovery that he is, is hopeful for and, and placed his faith in you for, Lord. And we just thank you for the recovery of George and Blanche as they continue to get better, Lord. And Ashley, is, she's recovered from her cold, Lord. We just lift it all up to you, Lord. And we lift everything up to you, Lord. We lift our nation, this world up to you, Lord, that's lost, both of them, and needs to come back to you. And if this world is going to recover, that's the way it's going to happen, is with your presence in each of our lives, Lord, and the recognition of that, so that we can turn around and against the odds of what the world is saying, bring love and peace mercy to the forefront of this world, Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for that, as much as our, the resurrection of our Savior, Lord, for it is through him that we are able to stand before you today in prayer, cleansed and clean and unblemished. And we just lift this all up to you and we pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this celebration that you gave us, this Passover meal that provides for us a life everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The night that they celebrated the Passover meal, the celebration of Israel's freedom from the oppression of Egypt to a life that God had given them. Jesus gathered his disciples one last time for a lesson. A lesson about servanthood. And in that lesson, he broke the bread. And he blessed it. And he said, take and eat. For this is my body, given up for you as a sacrifice for eternal life. And when they had finished, he took the cup and he blessed it and it said, take and drink for this is the cup of everlasting life. The blood shed of a new covenant. My blood shed for you. Father God, we just thank you for that shedding of his blood and the resurrection of his life that we celebrate today. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Isn't it great to know that he will reign forever? Last 
week we talked about how Jesus made it a point to be in Jerusalem on Passover. Methodically made his way to the temple with the intent of being present in the temple on the Passover. Along the way, teaching his disciples and followers about the salvation that he would soon be bringing to Israel and to all of humanity. His life and actions this past week point to Jesus as the Passover Lamb. Giving up heaven to come down here to be with us. And the 24 prophecies that are found in Isaiah 53 satisfying all of those. Grew up and was successful doing the work the Father had sent him to do. Success that brought rejection and made him despised by leaders and by people. He was taken away and appeared before kings and rulers and remained silent because they did not understand or believe or were willing to submit their authority and decisions to him. He took on the weight of our sins as he was counted among the criminals, beaten, scorned, and led like a lamb to the slaughter, pierced on the cross to bear the weight, <coughs> excuse me, pierced on the cross to bear the weight of our sin and our sickness, becoming the guilt offering, not just for Israel, but for all of mankind. Something only he could do, because he is the only person, the only human being who has lived without sin, unblemished. Interceding not just for a criminal, as he did on the cross, but for each and every life on this planet. As we will soon discover today, we will also see that his he will see his seed, that is you and I. He will have and give eternal life, be the light for the entire world to see, justifying the believers before the Father and be our ruler forevermore, our King. This morning's glorious resurrection, it sits at the heart of our Christian faith. Without it, our faith just simply does not exist. It doesn't hold up. Jesus' resurrection gives each of us as believers the affirmation that he is the Son of God provides the evidence that his sacrifice has been accepted by the Father and our salvation is complete. His resurrection says that those who believe will live a new life because he still lives. Declares that Jesus alone is the judge who will come again and judge the living and the dead. For those reasons, naturally, we understand why Satan is on the attack even 2,000 years later on the truth of the resurrection. There's so many lies that are being perpetrated about it. Lie number one, the disciples stole the body. Come on. There's a two-ton stone in front of that grave that had a hill that it had to be rolled up. Are ten men going to move that stone? Not to mention the guard, the Roman guard that was put in front of it of eight men sworn their loyalty to, to Rome 
upon the penalty of death for not upholding their orders, do you think they're going to let them come in and steal the body? Lie number two. Jesus didn't really die. He was just in what we would call today a coma. He passed out. In the cool of the inside of the ground of the, of the tomb rejuvenated his body somehow. But again, how does that stone get moved? Not to mention the guard who stabbed him, piercing his heart, providing the evidence that he was indeed dead. Lie number three, they went to the wrong grave. Went to the wrong grave. Let me ask you, one of the first people to go back to the grave was his mother. Do you think somebody's mother is going to go to the wrong grave? Let's be honest about that. Not to mention, the disciples would not go to the wrong grave because they would want to make sure that the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees didn't do anything to their Savior to prevent anything from happening. The resurrection is the ultimate climax in all four Gospels. Today we're going to look primarily at Luke's and John's version as they provide us with the most information about the resurrection. So the thing about the resurrection, it's not just about Jesus coming back to life. A life that was not a resuscitation, but a restoration. A resurrection. A lifting up of the dead. And unfortunately, his death left the people, his followers, mourning and with a serious lack of faith. Their hope and their faith was gone. Today we're going to talk about three groups. The women who were first there, the disciples, and a couple of travelers leaving Jerusalem. And you may be asking yourself, now oh, come on, the women... How could they lose faith? One of them was his mom. The other one was a woman who had followed him from the moment she was had her sins forgiven. Along with mothers of the, of the disciples, some other women. You're going to tell me that his mother lost faith in who he was after being visited by the angel before his birth and every, seeing everything that he did, he's, she's going to lose faith. She did. All of them did. Here's how we know. We'll look first at Luke's gospel, which tells us that they were going to that they were going to the tomb to finish preparing the body for burial. They forgot or didn't pay attention to what Jesus taught that week. That he would destroy the temple and in three days rise up. We know this because they were going back to finish the burial process. If he's going to rise, why do you need to finish the burial process? They were going back with the spices and everything else to anoint him and, and finish that process that they didn't get to finish because it was almost the Sabbath and the Passover. The other thing, Mark notes this in his gospel. They were saying to one another, who will roll the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They, wanted, they, they were questioning how they were going to get to the body. They didn't, if he was going to rise, they didn't need to get to the body. They didn't need to, do, to get into the tomb. And even when they discovered that the body was not in the tomb, they were baffled at how this could even happen. And 
And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this. They were perplexed. They were astounded, astonished, curious, questioning. They didn't know what to do. They were baffled about what was going on. John's Gospel records the story of Mary Magdalene alone. Initially, she refers to the other women later. But in verse 3, as she leaves the tomb and goes running back, looking for Peter and John, when she finds him, she says, They have taken our Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. The women lost their faith in what the Lord was doing, in what the Father's plan was, in what Jesus had taught them during those final hours of his life. Rather remarkable that these women, in particular, would lose their faith. As I said, they were some of Jesus' closest female friends. But despite their lack of faith, their lack of understanding, that flame that he had lit in them over the last two years was not completely extinguished. Think of it as a, a smoldering campfire when you, you're out camping and, and you've got that fire going the night before and you let it go. You get up in the morning. You blow on it a little bit, add some wood and some kindling to it. And what happens? It rekindles and it starts burning again. It was just that ember of, of, of heat in that fire. It was the same way for the women. The same three Gospels. Or, let me back up for a minute. The Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Tell us that an angel appeared before them, telling them that he was not here. Making it clear that Jesus has risen, not recovered, not been revived, but risen from the dead. And tell the, the women, go tell the disciples this, that he is risen. The word of God from the angels breathed into them or breathed upon them. John's version tells us that Mary Magdalene's faith and hope were restored by Jesus himself as she was leaving the garden and, he, and she saw him and thought he was the gardener. And he looks at her and says, Mary, just her name, kind of like uh, Zacchaeus. All he said was her name. And she went, Oh my Lord, it's you! Fell to her knees, grabbed his ankles. <coughs> Excuse me. The breath of the Word of God. Just as one's faith today starts with hearing the Word, the woman, the women, needed to hear the word of God to have their faith resurrected. And it started with words I think we all find reassuring. Do not be alarmed. How often do we see in scripture when the angels come before somebody and the first words out of their mouth are say, don't be afraid. I mean, I get it. An angel stood before me and said, and was there out of nowhere. I would probably be a little bit frightened myself. But there don't be alarmed. It was more than just a, hey, I'm an angel. God has something to say to you. It was a don't be alarmed. 
because you have nothing to worry about. He isn't gone. They didn't take him. He is risen, resurrected from the dead. Just like the ladies, we all struggle from time to time with our faith. Whether it was before or after our profession of faith, it doesn't matter. We've struggled with it. But these same words spoken to the women by the angels provide us with some encouragement that God, that, that Jesus Christ has been risen and is present with us, even when it seems that he's not there. In our darkest, deepest moments, we sometimes forget that the risen Savior is there. And as the, the, the Footprints poem says, to carry us through those times. So the women had their faith restored. They scrambled. They were given a commandment to go tell the disciples. But like the women, Peter, John, James, Andrew, and the rest of them, their hope and faith were also at an all-time low. John tells us they were hiding behind locked doors. And though Peter and John eventually took off and running for the tomb, they didn't want to believe the women at first. The words to them seemed like an idle tale, and they did not believe them, Luke tells us. An idle tale, kind of like that story we used to tell our parents when, they were, when, they, when we were trying to stay out of trouble, but they already knew the truth. They saw the empty tomb the neatly folded burial clothes, and they still did not understand what happened. In fact, Luke reports on Peter that he went home, home, not back to the disciples, but home, marveling at what he saw. And I've, got, I've, got, I've got this image in my head of, of Peter walking back Kind of like a Stan Laurel would do when he was, and he'd just sit there. You know, I see Peter going, man, I, did, I, I don't get it. What happened? And John tells us that neither he nor John understood what was happening. The last people on earth that we would expect to lose their faith and doubt were the 11 people closest to him. Those who were not, who were there for every lesson, not just the public teachings at the temple and on the, on the side of the mountain, on the, on the shores of the sea, but even those the late night lessons when Jesus explained the parables to them. The resurrection of faith occurred, sort of, at this point. Peter and John's experiences were just the beginning of what was happening. They were given the physical evidence, but they had yet to hear from God as the women had. But it was the ember there that would ignite. It was starting to, to warm up and glow. That would eventually become that eternal flame that would spread around the world. The completed resurrection of the disciples' faith would come. But in between now and later today, we have the, the two men on the road to Emmaus. Actually, it doesn't say two men, it says two travelers. 
Uh, there are some that speculate that this was a husband and wife. Two men, husband and wife, doesn't make much difference. There were two people traveling seven miles from Jerusalem, northwest to Emmaus. There's an old saying we've got up here, as goes leadership, so goes the team. In other words, what leadership does is what the team does. What was the leadership doing at this point? Hiding, fearful, faithless, hopeless. And these, two, these two individuals were walking, discussing what was going on, what had happened in the last 72 hours, and had apparently come to the conclusion that all was lost. That is, until a stranger comes along and teaches them from the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures that they knew. And he talked with such a conviction that their hearts began to burn within. <coughs> Excuse me. Once again, the word stands out as the determining factor for a resurrection of hope and faith. In the believer. Finally, when they get to where they were going, they invite this stranger in who just happens to be Jesus, who finishes his teaching with them, and all of a sudden they're like, like Mary, their eyes are open and they're like, My Lord! Hold that thought. Well, he disappears, and they hightail it back. To Jerusalem at night. The most dangerous time to travel in ancient Jerusalem or ancient, ancient Israel. But they knew they needed to relay the message to the leadership, to the disciples, that the Lord Himself was indeed alive. And when they got there, they find out in Luke's Gospel. That Jesus had also already appeared to Peter. Unfortunately, it doesn't say anything about, our scriptures don't say anything about that interaction. But we know it happened. They say it happened. And they're like, you too? So now Peter's eyes have been opened a little more. Their eyes have been opened all by the word of God. Brings us full circle back to the disciples. Now keep in mind, all of this that we're talking about happened between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Today. All three of these events. The Emmaus travelers were probably just getting on the road now to head back. Today, we join with our friends and our families in a celebration of the Lord's resurrection. Events that we sometimes just we, we struggle to, to, to understand. But can you imagine being present that first resurrection day with the group? The women come back and say, Jesus is alive! John and Peter come back to the group and say, well, we found the empty grave. Don't know what it means yet, but we found the empty grave. And then, as you're getting ready to celebrate the evening meal, two believers return to you and say, guess what? He's alive! He's alive! Sorry, had to get there. What more could possibly happen today? Twelve hours that changed the world. Ten out of the eleven are present, including a few others, the women, the two from Emmaus, in a locked room <coughs> in a house. Presumed, presumed by some to be the upper room where they celebrated the Passover meal. But 
But there they are. John, in verse 19, on that evening, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Notice that John points out very clearly the doors were locked because they were afraid of their, of their fellow Israelites, their friends, their countrymen, they were probably sitting there eating and debating the events that had happened that day. I can just see this. They're gathered around the table. And I've got this, I've got this vision in my head of kind of like the Irish pub. And the men are all gathered around the table. They're debating whose soccer team is better than the other soccer team. Or let me rephrase that, we're talking Irish. Whose football team is better than whose football team? They're, they're debating what had happened. What you saw him, what, Mary, what did he say to you? What, what was it like? What, well, Cleopas, you were walking with him for hours. What was it like? It just this boisterous exchange of stories and questions and pondering. And then suddenly a familiar voice penetrates this boisterous discussion. Peace be with you. Hush falls across the room, and you see it in slow motion. As Jesus is there before their very eyes. They were startled and frightened, which, if any of us were in a locked room and a person suddenly appeared there in flesh and blood, we'd probably get startled too. But Jesus does what only he could do. Our human nature would be to look at this table full of people and start chastising them for their lack of faith, for their lack of understanding, for their, the, for their not being able to see the truth before their very eyes. Not Jesus. Jesus stands there I can almost see him just kind of standing there. Peace be with you. Why are you so confused and distraught? He offers him his hands, his feet, his side, all as evidence for them to, to touch and put their fingers in and verify what was going on. Proving that he is not some spirit, but a living, breathing human being. And he sits down and he joins them for the meal. And he begins teaching them, reminding them of what their scriptures say about God's anointed one. And how he must suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. That it must happen this way so that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations. And I love verse 48. The implication here is, as my disciples, you will be witnesses of all of these things. When you receive the Holy Spirit from my Father. In other words, you guys are going to be the ones to spread the news. To tell the people of my resurrected life. Of the need for repentance and faith in, in me as the Son of God and the Messiah. You see, a restored resurrection, or excuse me, let me rephrase that, a restored or resurrected faith isn't about the evidence. It isn't about the empty tomb, although that evidence is irrefutable. I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but the common factor with each group 
in the resurrection of their faith and hope was the word of God. Not the presence of Jesus there, not seeing him, not seeing the empty tomb, but hearing the word of God from the angels and from Jesus himself. And as Paul wrote to the church at Rome, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. When they first saw or heard about the empty tomb, the women, Peter, John, the Emmaus travelers, all believed that something happened. And that, and that well, maybe he is alive. But that faith was based on the physical evidence. The body being gone, the grave clothes neatly folded, the stone rolled away from it from the, temp, the tomb. It's all fine and dandy. It can be the, 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 the hook or the bait on the hook. But it's the word of Jesus, the word of God that Jesus wanted his disciples to have faith in. Jesus pointed them to our Old Testament scriptures. And they were enabled then to announce the message of God for the rest of the world. Forgiveness of sins through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his one and only Son. And we, as believers, are commissioned to do the same thing to restore faith in today's world. The problem today is not that different from the first Resurrection Sunday. Not knowing, let alone believing the Word of God, especially where it concerns the Messiah. Now we talked about how amazing it would be to see also Jesus is there before you that night. But imagine it as the greatest teacher teaching the greatest themes from the greatest book in history. Opening your heart and the hearts of those present to receive every syllable of the word of God. Not to mention that now you've been commissioned and your lips would be the ones to tell the others what you learned by following him. You see, the key to understanding our Bible is to see Jesus Christ on every single page. Jesus was not teaching theology or doctrine in this final lesson. He was teaching about the things that concerned himself. How this all pointed towards what had to happen for humanity to be restored before God. The Emmaus travelers were not won by the presence of Jesus, but by the word of God coming from Jesus' mouth that burned in their hearts. They had no idea who he was as he was teaching about the prophets, the law, and Moses. Mary Magdalene failed to recognize him, saw him as the gardener, until he looked down at her and said, Mary, don't touch me, I'm not yet glorified, but go and tell the others the word of Christ coming from his mouth. Even, even the evening group hiding behind locked doors, <coughs> excuse me, hiding behind locked doors. It was when Jesus finally came, sure he gave them the physical evidence of his hands and his side and his feet, but was it was when he reminded them of their scriptures. The same lessons he'd been teaching them for four years, for three years. 
You see, the more we receive the word of God, the more we will want to be with him. The best evidence of a living Christ is that we have something exciting to share with others. And that excitement comes from diving into the Word, from knowing the Word, the Word that can change lives in an instant. And understanding, being able to point people to Christ as the Lamb who died so that they could have everlasting life. That word is that Jesus came to offer forgiveness through grace and mercy by, the death, by his death and his resurrection. See, today is a day like no other. It's a day like no other because the Lamb is risen. And because the Lamb is risen, the church, and not just us, not the building, but every believing person on this earth is alive and will continue to live forever. As our song said, we are risen because the King gave his life and will be on the throne forevermore. Resurrected children, that is what and who we are. Resurrected physically and in spirit to tell the word to others. Father God, you have given us this story, the story of the Lamb, of Jesus, from start to finish. He's there on every page so that we can experience your grace and mercy. Even there, even today, he is there as our Lamb, ready to carry us <clears throat> through our worst of times and to walk through us in our, through with us in our best of times. He is the lamb that we can trust because you are true to your word. And Jesus, we thank you for giving your life. We could not pay the price for our sins. And I accept your payment in full and invite you to be our Lord and Savior so that we can have eternal life with you. And we lift this prayer up to you in your holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on this Easter Sunday. Hope you have a joyous and blessed celebration with your friends and families and go out and proclaim the word. Have a blessed week.